Well, I'm going to be talking about foundations this morning, and I looked up a little bit of information from a site that builds houses on the coastline. And uh, they tell us that the coastal foundation of a beach home is perhaps the most important structural element. Without a solid foundation, the rest of the house falls apart. In coastal home building projects, the harsher conditions of the environment make it more difficult to design a stable coastal foundation that will last. A foundation built on sandy ground is subjected to erosion and, and scour. The danger is that the land beneath the foundation will be removed out from under it, causing the house to collapse. Sea swells can suddenly rush up against the house, and the greater the surface area contacted by the water, the greater the danger of the structure collapsing. Coastal home building codes often require an open building or an open foundation with a minimum required height for the main deck. This lifts the home up on stilts and allows the water to flow safely beneath the house. The depth that the beams are sunk into the ground is also important. Improperly anchored foundation beams can be dislodged in heavy storms, and this can cause the house to be tilted, making it unsafe for habitation. We have been in a sermon series on the greatest sermon, and that greatest sermon is the sermon that Jesus preached to launch his ministry, the Sermon on the Mount. Uh, there was great crowds of people that were coming to him, people who had been healed, who, people who had heard about his, his miracles that had been performed, and they knew very little about him, but they gathered in to hear him. And he sat down on the mountain, which was the way that, that uh, the uh, teachers taught in that day. They would sit down and, uh, and teach, and, and it, it also showed authority. He sat there uh, on, on the side of the mountain, and he began to teach the disciples who, had, who had, he had uh, recently chosen, as well as the great crowd that was gathered around him. And we've been looking at the various aspects of the Sermon on the Mount over the last several weeks, and today we're going to conclude with the message, your deeds reflect your relationship. Your deeds reflect your relationship. And in this passage, Jesus tells about the importance of a proper foundation for our faith. We must make sure that our lives are built on the words of Jesus, the Word of God. As we realize the importance of a foundation uh, in building something and, and constructing something, that uh, it is very important to uh, realize that we need a strong foundation in our faith and in our personal lives as well. Well, as we look at this passage about the foundation, uh, we, we want to begin back, we, we touched on this just a little bit uh, two weeks ago, but uh, today I want to go into it a little bit further. He talks about the fruit of, frost, of false prophets, the fruit of false prophets, because the, the truth that he is giving to us is set against the teaching of the false prophets. Jesus tells us to watch out for false prophets and how to discern if they are false teachers. In Matthew chapter 7, verses 15 to 17, it says, Watch out for false prophets. They come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they are ferocious wolves. By their fruit you will recognize them. Do not pick grapes from thorn bushes or figs from thistles. Likewise, every good tree bears good fruit, but a bad tree bears bad fruit. In, in many ways, the, the false prophet and the false teachers will come across as if they are following Christ. Uh, they, they look good, they sound good, they, they talk about Jesus somewhat. Uh, sometimes they don't even mention Jesus, but uh, they, they just um, make you feel like they're, be, that they're part of the church and uh, that they're proclaiming truth. But their motives are the same as Satan's. They come to steal and to kill and destroy. And Satan is wise enough not to make these false prophets look like they're evil uh, because no, no believers would listen to them. But uh, he, they, they come uh, as wolves in sheep's clothing. They look safe. They look like they belong 
but at the same time, they're not standing on the truth of God's word. False prophecy or far, false teaching is marked by personal revelation or personal interpretation. In other words, they, they have a, a word from God that nobody else has ever had. They have something to add, something different, or they come up with a new interpretation of God's word. In 2 Peter chapter 1, verses 20 to 21, Peter talks about this. He says, Above all, you must understand that no prophecy of Scripture came about by the prophet's own interpretation, for prophecy never had its origin in the will of man. But men spoke from God as they were carried along by the Holy Spirit. In other words, the, the word of God didn't originate with us. There are some people that argue against the Bible and they say, oh, that's just a, a book that men wrote. No, God inspired men to write it. It's God's word. It's not their word. And it is not uh, open to human interpretation. The Holy Spirit will never reveal to you anything that is contrary to the known will of God declared in Scripture. Okay? If somebody says, well, I have a word from the Lord. Or, or I had a dream, or I have a prophecy, and what they say does not agree with the Word of God, that is false prophecy. That is false teaching. It does not confirm the Word of God, or the Word of God does not confirm what they say. It may sound innocent. It may sound Christian. It may sound good. It might even be easy. It might be, make you happy. But if it's, if it's contrary to the Word of God, then it is not the truth that we need to follow. The presence of false teaching in every age is indisputable. In 2 Peter chapter 2, verses 1 through 3, it says, But there were also false prophets among the people, just as there will be false teachers among you. They will secretly introduce destructive heresies, even denying the sovereign Lord who bought them, bringing swift destruction on themselves. Many will follow their shameful ways and will bring the way of truth into disrepute. In their greed, these teachers will exploit you with stories they have made up. Their condemnation has long been hanging over them, and their destruction has not been sleeping. You see, the Apostle Peter says, back when the prophets were giving the word of God, there were false prophets. And Peter says in, the, his, in his time, as the church was being started and developing and growing and, and Christians were being persecuted, there were already false prophets among the Christians who were trying to get them off track. And, and, and several of the New Testament books were written by Paul and Peter and others to try to correct these errors in, in, uh, in doctrine and, and what they were supposed to follow. And be sure that there are false teachers and false doctrines uh, and false prophets among us today. And, and we have to be careful. And we, and we have to be familiar with the Word of God. I never worked at a bank, but I've, I've said this many times, and I've had bankers in the church uh, when I've said this, and I've never had anybody disagree with me. So I'm going to continue to say it. I think it's true. When someone is, works at a bank... They're not trained in how to identify all the possible ways that money can be counterfeited. They are taught how to recognize a real dollar bill. And when they are very familiar with what is real, what is not real, it, it stands out. They see, oh, well, this isn't real because of this or that detail that they were taught is in a real dollar bill. And the problem today for many in the church is that we don't really know what the Bible says. We, we don't study the Bible. We don't read the Bible. We don't, we don't get into God's Word. And so we're easily swayed by everything that we read, everything that we hear, whether it's on television or a radio or a computer or whatever it is. We're just easily swayed because we're not familiar with what is true. And so we have to understand and know what God's Word truly says in order that we can recognize what is not true by these who come as wolves in sheep clothing. And, and Peter gave us several characteristics of these people and what they say. They secretly introduce destructive heresies. 
You know, they, they're, they're maybe even teaching the Word. They might even have started with a Bible verse, but they are introducing destructive heresies. It's kind of like if I offered you a cup of coffee this morning and say, don't worry about it, and only has two drops of arsenic poisoning in it. You know, it's, it's just, I mean, it's 99.9% pure. It's only got two drops, you see. And that's what false, pro- they don't come out and, and change everything about Christianity. They just manipulate the truth a little bit and, and, and catch us off guard. They introduce destructive heresies. Denying Jesus as sovereign Lord, any, any ministry that does not acknowledge uh, Jesus as Lord, we should not follow. Uh, many will follow their destructive ways. Uh, it's amazing how difficult it is to get people to go to church and hear the truth and how easy it is for false prophets to get a following and great crowds to go after them. They bring the, the way of truth into disrepute. When, when it's finally found out that they're false prophets, so many people, their, their influence is damaged. Uh, their, their opinion of Christ and the church is damaged because of these false prophets and these who, who bring the truth into disrepute. They are greedy. Uh, they have all kinds of schemes and ways to make all kinds of money. Uh, there are some people uh, that I'm thinking of in these kinds of situations that they make enough in a year they could pay our church's debt. And uh, we would take that if they wanted to give that to us. But, I mean, they, they make money in hundreds and hundreds of thousands of dollars and even millions of dollars a year. And they exploit their listeners with stories they made up. I mentioned a few weeks ago about someone that used to come to this church when I first came to pastor, and they said, well, why do you preach the Bible so much? Why don't you just make something up and make it interesting? Well, because that's false. You don't, the last thing you need is my opinion, and uh, the last thing you need is something that I made up. What you need when you come to the house of God and what you need for the foundation of your life is the Word of God, the truth. And we need to be, examine the truth and learn the truth of God. And Jesus goes on further and he says, it's not works, but relationship that is the difference. Listen closely to this. this these are the words of Jesus. Matthew 7, 21 to 23. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but only he who, he who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. Many will say to me on that day, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name and in in your name drive out demons and perform many miracles? Then I will tell them plainly, I never knew you. Away from me, you evil doers. It's possible to do the works of God without having a relationship with God. And so here Jesus is saying on that day, these who who have many followers and and they've convinced people with their many miracles and their great oratory, uh, Jesus will say, away from me, I never knew you. It's the one who does the will of the Father in heaven. It's the relationship. He says, I never knew you. It's that personal relationship that is essential. Then the second thing that we want to notice here are these words of Jesus. Okay, this is, These words of Jesus are in contrast to false prophets and false teachers. Uh, the words of Jesus are true and they are eternal. In Matthew chapter 7, verses 28 and 29, it says, When Jesus had finished saying these things, the crowds were amazed at his teaching because he taught as one who had authority and not as the teachers of the law. It was very clear to the people who were listening to him that he was proclaiming the truth. There was an authority to the teaching because he was teaching them the truth. I want to take just a couple minutes here in the middle of the sermon to kind of go back over and remember what Jesus had said. He said, later on, he said that these, these words of mine uh, that... Um, well, how we relate to the Word of God and, and to Jesus' Word will determine 
the foundation of our life and what's going to happen. And we'll get to that a little bit later. But I just want to review for a moment some of the things that we have talked about in the Sermon of the Mount. In uh, Matthew chapter 5, verses 3 to 12, Jesus tells us eight ways to be blessed. You know, everybody wants to be blessed. If, if I were to say, how many want to be blessed? Everybody's hand would go up. We all want to be blessed. Jesus gave us eight ways to be blessed, and we don't like some of them. But if we would do what Jesus tells us to do and humble ourselves and do what he would say, he gives us eight ways that we can be blessed. Jesus tells us how to make your influence matter. In Matthew chapter 5, verses 13 to 48, you might say, well, I'm just an ordinary person. I don't have a a great position. I don't have a lot of power. Jesus says, your influence matters. And he tells us how our influence can matter as salt and light in the world. Jesus tells us that it's not about us. In Matthew 6, 1 through 18, uh, we, we are taught from the time that we're little children that it is about us. You know, everything is about us. And, and before children even go to school sometimes, we ask them what they want to be when they grow up. It's, it's all about them rather than, well, what, does, what do you think God has for you? What, you know, what do you think God wants you to do? It's not about us. It's about Jesus. Jesus tells us about worry-free investments in Matthew six nineteen to 34. I don't know what kind of investments you may have in this world, but whatever they are, if they're material and and money and those kinds of things, there's no security in all of that. Uh, That could be gone before we get out of church today. Uh, You talk to people who have been through some of these floods and fires and other things, earthquakes that have happened around the world, or uh, just uh, see what happens in our stock market from time to time and all of those things. But Jesus gives us worry-free investments. We can put our investments in heaven and we don't have to worry about them. Jesus tells us that grace is greater than the law in Matthew 7, 1 through 14. Uh, We're not to judge one another based upon our, our own misconceptions, but we are to Uh, offer the grace of God and forgiveness. And then in in these verses from uh, Matthew 7, 15 to 27, Jesus tells us to be aware of false prophets and to put his words into practice. These words of Jesus, and that's just a synopsis of what we've talked about in the Sermon on the Mount. In a real sense, the Gospels are filled with the words of Jesus, not just the Sermon on the Mount, but the four Gospels. But not only that, the entire Bible is God's Word. John said that in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was talking about Jesus. The Word became flesh and dwelt among us. Jesus is the Word of God, and so the whole Bible is is ours uh, to follow. And then we want to look finally at what Jesus said, that the proof is in the practice. The proof is in the practice. It's not hearing the words of Jesus that makes the difference. It's not putting, but it is putting his words into practice. It's not hearing the words of Jesus, it's putting his words into practice. Notice in Matthew 7, 24, Jesus says, Therefore, everyone who hears these words of mine and puts them in the practice is like a wise man who built his house on the rock. And then in verse 26, but everyone who hears these words of mine and does not put them into practice is like a foolish man who built his house on the sand. Notice that both the wise and the foolish hear the same words and face the same storms. In Matthew 7, 25, the rain came down, the streams rose, and the winds blew and beat against that house, yet it did not fall because it, its foundation was on the rock. But then in Matthew seven twenty seven, the rain came down, the storms rose, and the winds blew and beat against that house, and it fell with a great crash. Both the wise and the foolish heard the same words of Jesus. Both the, the wise and the foolish went through the exact same storm. The rain came, the streams rose, the wind blew, and beat against the house. 
but the results were different. Jesus did not promise that you would not face storms if you follow him. We can be in the midst of doing God's will and be in the storm. God never promised that we wouldn't face storms, but Jesus did promise that he would not forsake you in the storm. He will be with us in every area of life. But we live in a fallen world, and whatever other people face, Christians face as well. We face financial setbacks. We face discouragement. We face illness and death and all of the things we could go on through. September 11, 2001 impacted the hearts of Christians just like it did other people in the world. It, we face the same storms. It's the results that are different. The wise and the foolish went through all the same. They heard the same words. They went through the same storms. But the wise and foolish have different responses and different results. The wise man put the word of God into practice and his house did not fall. The foolish heard but did not put it into practice and it fell with a great crash. Going to church does not automatically make you a true Christ follower. We can come every week and hear the word. But if we do not put his word into practice, we are as the foolish person. At church, you hear the words of Jesus, the word of God. And it's foolishness to hear his word and not put it into practice. Wisdom is putting the word of God to practice in your life. It's great to come here and fellowship with one another. It's great to come and sing together. It's, co- it's great to come and hear God's word together, but none of it makes a difference unless we practice it in our lives. To hear, to participate, to know, and not follow through and do what God's word says makes us foolish. And all of this relationship that we're talking about this morning begins with a decision to follow Jesus. It begins by us saying, yes, Lord, I know that I'm a sinner and that I need your forgiveness. And this morning as we close the message with, with prayer, I'm going to pray a prayer of repentance. And if you've never made a decision to become a follower of Jesus Christ, I would like for you to pray this prayer with me in your heart. You don't have to say it out loud, but if, if you agree with it in your heart, God knows your heart. And if you truly want to have him turn your life around and forgive your sins and you want to begin to practice the word of God in your life, just pray this prayer along with me in the midst of the, of the closing prayer. Lord, we thank you this morning for your word. We thank you for the original prophets and apostles through whom this word came. We thank you for people down through the ages, many who gave their lives to preserve this word and to pass it on. And Lord, we are the recipients of the benefits of all their sacrifice. And Lord, as we come, and many of us come every Sunday, many of us sit in connection groups and studies, many will be in small groups. Lord, help us not to go and just say, oh, that was good. And I felt good because I was there, but Lord, Help us to take your word and put it into practice in our lives. And Lord, if there's anyone here today who doesn't know you as Savior and are not following you, I pray, dear Lord, that they would pray this prayer with me in their heart. Dear Jesus, I know that I'm a sinner. I was born in sin. I've committed acts of sin and rebellion against you. And I confess my sin. And I repent this morning. I turn. I turn from my sin and I turn to you. I change my mind. I change my direction. And Lord, it's now my desire to follow you, to take your words and to put it into practice in my life. Lord, I pray this morning that each person who prays this would know that their sins are forgiven 
and that they would give themselves this day to become a follower of Jesus Christ. Lord, may you be glorified in each of our lives. And Lord, may you be with us this morning as we go from this place. We'll give you honor and glory and praise for all that you do. In Jesus' name, amen.